we got to go down to San Diego area. It was actually Oceanside, um, but San Diego area. Nick's soccer team played in the Surf Cup. They got second place. They did really good. Here's some, most of them at the beach here. It felt weird. I felt like I left fall because it was like shorts and t-shirts weather. And then I was like, okay, I got to get back in the pants when I come back up north. So today we're going to do mass spectroscopy. Um, our next instrumentation, like a spectroscopy instrumentation thing we'll talk about. Uh, we've done IR and NMR, and now we'll do mass spec. And then maybe we'll start chapter eight. We'll see if I get far enough along. Some of this is repeats. We have the exam three corrections. And uh, no, the water wasn't too cold. It was cold, but the kids were swimming and they're having fun. I put my feet in. And uh, the exam corrections that Monday, Wednesday lab had it last week, but the Tuesday, Thursday lab, they'll have it to tomorrow in, in lab. And then make all your corrections off of the exam, not on the exam. And then the after exam three quiz plus, because it has an extra question, has two questions on it. That's gonna be Tuesday, Thursday for their lab section. So, yep. And then you can come to lab early. Yes. Is there a question or does someone need to mute maybe? Okay. Yeah, come to lab if you'd like, as always. Uh, finish and turn in extractions, that was, I was hoping to get it last week, but I know, especially the Tuesday, Thursday lab, they haven't had a lot of lab time, but I'm going to try to help us get through this in lab this week. And uh, the, then the, also the chromatography experiment. And then to help with the extraction lab, I'm giving this quiz today and tomorrow in lab, because most of you are struggling with the extractions because you're not understanding it. Once you get to the point where you understand it, then you can do it much quicker and enjoy the process and just instead of just feeling like you're following a random set of steps. Okay, and then um, you'll be asked on that quiz, <clears throat> the big four acid base reactions that we saw before we quizzed, I you got quiz on that earlier in the semester. And then also parts of the marsh, monster extraction diagram, like if you have an amine and an acid and you add one molar HCl, which one's gonna get extracted into the aqueous layer. And then, Let's try to finish chromatography this week as well, the TLCs and, and things like that. And then homework F is due this week, uh, this Wednesday, Thursday, chapter seven. And we got a quiz on Wednesday, Thursday. We got a lot of things this week. I'm trying to keep you going. Like basically little assignments to help you practice for the final exam. So I want you to do well in the final exam. So that's, it's actually gonna be December on Wednesday, December 1st. And many of you, if you feel like I can shave or you can go December beard, just keep going. And then I will give you the exact quiz for the GSA. Yeah, so at the end of this mass spec material to memorize, it has a quiz. I'll just give you that quiz. I'll go over it today in lecture as well. <laughs> Distillation and GCMS, the all online lab is due next week. Um, so that one, you can do outside of labs. You don't have to be. I want you to be able to finish um, chromatography this as well. So that one you have to do in lab. So quiz summary this week. You have Monday, Tuesday of the monster extraction quiz on Monday, Tuesday, and Tuesday also has the after exam three quiz, and then Wednesday it's the mass spec quiz. Okay. And I've added more exit questions to our entrance and exit questions link which is in the step by step and linked here uh i added the i had some questions up there for wednesday's lab last week that the thursday lab people didn't see so if you want more practice go check it out and here we go two more weeks left you can do this come to the live lectures this is it really helps to just get it done if you can you know instead of putting it off to watch later come to office hours uh Come to lab early and you know ask questions, get stuff done. And come to Morgan's past peer sessions and ask for help. Let's just really push hard at the end of this two this next two weeks and see if we can get you know as high a grade as much learning as possible because it'll help with your grade this semester, but it'll also help for next 12B 
you know, the more you learn now, the easier 12B is later. And we have a new SOTW student of the week, a Falcon from Colfax High, bio, biology major, will transfer to Sac State, will be a research tech in biology, and is a Twitch gamer, plays um, RPG games like Skyrim. RPG is a uh, role playing games. And then has about 5,000 followers on Me Too. Has two dogs, Bill and Ven. Volunteers at her church as a teacher for preschool kids. And here is Bill. And here's Ben. Cute, huh? And then here's a little joke. This is her bitmoji. Help, I'm being ghosted. Yeah, let's let's totally hang out on Saturday. Don't call me, I'll call you. But you don't have my number. So who is it? Can you tell from the bitmoji who this is? Cecily Swinson. So let's give a round of applause to our new student of the week. Cecily. Okay. Okay. Any questions about the uh, outline? All right. No questions. Then we'll get started. So I'm going to do a quick SN2 E2. I'm going to do a few examples again. I want to make sure you're pretty good at this. We'll be doing this a lot through 12A and then 12B as well. Okay. I mentioned before how the rubber meets the road at a certain spot. There was the chapter seven stuff here. That's the homework. Uh, actually, let me do it this way. So if we have um, this part right here, where the rubber meets the road, the branched, it goes E2, even with the small one. Okay, I'll show you what I mean. So if I, Go with a primary electrophile that's not branched, say this one here. If I add a strong base that's sterically hindered, say like sodium hydroxide, I will get SN2 as my major product. And I'll get E2 as my minor product. So this is a primary unhindered. Or I could say more specifically unbranched. And then my minor product would be the alkene. Okay, now at this point, you should be able to draw out the products like I just did without having to think too much about it. Like you should know that you should see this mechanism in your head. It shouldn't be like something that you have to like, oh wait, how does that work? If you're still not able to just see this SN2 happening right away, then you gotta really just practice, 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 draw it out, draw it out 20 times. And you also need to be able to do the E2 mechanism in your head where 
deprotonates one carbon away and then group leaves. Okay. So that's what you get for that. And then if you, so this, so let me be more specific here. This is a strong base, but it's small. If we switch this up and we go, oh, now I'm going to treat it with a, a stronger base. Say the E2 superstar, potassium T butoxide, say like T butanol is a solvent here. If I do that, now my major products will be the E2. So SN2 will be minor. E2 will be major. That's where it switches over. So you will get some of this SN2, but you'll get mostly E2. And then this is because our base is, it's a strong base that's sterically hindered. All right, that's where it switches over. Uh, and then branching can also affect it too. Uh, I'll do a quick one really quick on the next slide. So let's go. Oh, I'm going to add a slide actually. That's what I want to do. Paste. Now, if I take and I add a primary electrophile with branching, I'm going to get, even with the small base, small strong base, I'm going to get E2 major. SN2 minor. So the E2 will be the alkene and the SN2 is the, uh, there it is. So that's because it's a strong base. That's small, but this branch gets in the way. That branch blocks the backside SN2. Attack, right? All right. And then for the SN1, E1, we did a lot of that. You just got to have a good leading group, usually a weak nucleophile, weak base, and heat and cool. All right, yeah, that's good. Too. <clears throat> this one we're going to see a lot, though. I'm going to have be asking you shortly to like, ooh, I want you to make, say, this alcohol. How can we make this? We'll have a question like, how do we make this alcohol? as the major product, and we'll have to come up with a way to avoid this E2. We'll talk about that later. Okay, um, now, any questions about that stuff? On, on the final exam, I'm gonna ask you to do this sort of thing. I'm gonna ask you to, I'll give you like an electrophile and a nucleophile slash base, and you, I want you to draw out the possible products and tell me which one's major. Okay. So now on to mass spectroscopy. So mass spectroscopy is pretty cool. I think you'll like it. It, uh, it makes sense, I think. I mean, it can get complicated, but we, we kind of go over the basics of it. 
and you'll understand it. So here it is. What you do in a mass spectrometer is you send a molecule into the instrument. Let's say I got like this guy. Let's go one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, this is a good one. You send the molecule into the mass spectrometer and it gets um, injected in just a tiny amount of it, just a na like nano nanoliters of it. And um, it gets vaporized to a gas and then pushed, well, most of the time, like, I'm sorry, I'm kind of talking two things here. If you're doing gas chromatography before the mass spec, then it gets made into a gas and it gets, gets separated in a column, but then after it comes out of the column into the mass spectrometer, it gets hit with an electron beam. This is probably the most common thing, the way mass spec works. And the electron beam, when it hits this molecule as it's going into the mass spectrum, it mass spectrometer, as it gets hit with the electron beam, the electron beam can ionize it, knock off a single electron. So what sort of electrons do I have on this molecule? I've got these electrons. How would you describe these ones here? The electrons, two, the pair of electrons between the carbons, those are sigma bonded electrons. All right, good. What other kind of electrons do we have on this molecule? Pi bonded electrons, yep. And what's the third type of electrons? Lone pair electrons, yep. Oh, no. <laughs> so which ones do you think are most likely to come off of this molecule? Yeah, the lone pair electrons, they come off the, the most commonly, but the other ones can come off too. But uh, we're going to mostly focus on when the lone pair electron comes off. So when it comes off, it creates a radical cation. This is called the molecular ion. Does that seem like it would be a low energy thing? A radical cation, it's both a radical and a cation. It's a very high energy thing actually. It's not very stable. This thing just like falls apart on its own constantly. So when your molecule gets sent into a mass spectrometer, it's gonna get destroyed, but you only need to use a very small amount of it. So it's not a big deal. So you got this molecular ion. Oh, it also goes by this symbol I'll draw below there. And it's it's basically, it's the molecule, the full molecule minus one light electron. Remember electrons almost weigh nothing. No mass. Um, and there's another definition we need to say. It's by definition, it is the molecule with only its most abundant isotope. It is most of its. All right, so let me show you what I mean. It, this in the symbol we use, I use this symbol for it. M, capital M with a dot for a radical and a plus for a cation. So that's the molecular ion. And by definition, we go with the most abundant isotope. So most abundant isotope of carbon is which? 12, 13, 14? Twelve. 
the most abundant isotope of hydrogen. H1. And the most abundant isotope of oxygen. Sixteen. Oh, what? Right, eighteen. Oxygen sixteen. I'll make that more clear. Six oxygen. And then, if we want to keep going, we'll just do a few more. Nitrogen, bromine is seventy-nine. Okay, so it has to be the most abundant isotope of the atoms. So then, what happens is the molecule as it travels through the mass spectrometer, its path gets bent by a magnetic field. So you have, I'll draw, I'll try to draw like a magnet here. Color it in. So you got a magnet and the magnetic field will cause ions to feel a force that bends their path. And that ion is going to have its path bent towards the detector. It's going to detect the ion. And uh, this, the bend of this path, that's the key to this whole thing. It depends on two things. the mass of the of the ion and the charge and we do something else we set the mass spectrometer to give just plus one charges, just take off one electron. So it's, it's actually, it's like the path is just meant that path is then by the mass divided by the charge, which then is equal to the mass divided by plus one, which is just the mass divided by plus one, right? We give it the unit mass to charge ratio. And it's M to Z is the symbol. Z, you might remember, is the symbol that's used for um, like the atomic number of a molecule. So like the positive protons of a molecule. All right, so. Um, this molecule then will hit right here at a certain mass. That's how our detector will tell us the mass of the molecules. So let's see, what kind of a molecule do we have here? What's the formula for this? It is C12345, C5H10O. Um, it only has one degree of unsaturation, so it should have just double the number of hydrogens as it has car carbon. So let's see, make sure though, three, four, five, six, seven, a910, yep. And now the molecular ion is made up of the most abundant isotopes. So we have to do this proper. The carbon 12 is the most abundant isotope, right? My screen won't let me write over there. It's annoying. Okay, so let's do this right. Uh, I'm gonna make that smaller.
So we got carbon 12. There are five of them and they each weigh 12, the most abundant isotope. So that's gonna be 55, 60. And then the hydrogen, there is 10 of those and the most abundant isotope weighs one, so that's 10. And then the oxygen, 16, there's only one of those in that way, 16, so that's 16. And so the mass of this should be 86 mass to charge units. Now, the, the arithmetic that's going on here, it's super easy to make mistakes. So I'm gonna strongly encourage you and repetitively encourage you to always double check your math on this the arithmetic. It's so easy to mess up. So let's go again, let's go. There's five times five, 55, 60, yep. 10 hydrogens and one, 10, and then 16. Yeah, that's six, six, seven, eight, yep. Master charge 86. So that means I should see a signal about here. that corresponds to 86 mass to charge. All right. Ryan, I made a mistake somewhere. What did I make a mistake? Carbon's 10. Oh, I wrote 10 for the isotope of hydrogen. Thanks, Ryan. Whoops. This is the most abundant, most, this is the heaviest isotope of hydrogen, hydrogen 10. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Okay, so now, um, there's more to mass spectroscopy than just that. Let me show you. This molecule here is one, two, three, four, five. So this is two pentanone. I'm gonna to go to SDBS and see if I can find its mass spectrum. Gotta be patient with STVS. Come on, STVS. Two and there it is. So we've been looking at carbon NMR, hydrogen NMR, IR. Now we can add mass spec to our list. And you can see up here, it lists the mass to charge ratio as 86, like we calculated. But there's a lot more going on here too, huh? Let me bring this over to uh, our jam board. Oh. So what's going on? We said, I said it should weigh, it should have a signal at 86 and it does. Here it is, this is 86. That's for the molecular ion, you know, and it just loses one electron only, but it's got a bunch of other signals, huh? And this one's like much taller than the, Molecular ion, it's interesting, got one here. So that this is, uh, I'll explain what these are, are made from. And um, this is the, the part of the big strength of mass spectroscopy. Not only can you find the molar mass of the molecule with its most abundant isotopes by finding its molecular ion peak, but these are called fragments. These are all lighter than 86, right? And these fragments are like a fingerprint this particular molecule will give you this fragment pattern all the time. So you get, get another, like kind of like the IR spectrum has a fingerprint region. Mass spec has like a fingerprint region. 
Okay, and the, but before we go to those fragments, let's look over here. See this little little one right here, little teeny one. That one weighs eighty seven mass to charge. What do you think might cause that something to weigh just one heavier? Yes, this is this one here is called the isotope peak. Or an isotope peak. That is when you have not just the most abundant isotopes, but also one more isotope that's heavier. Like perhaps it has a could have that this carbon is a carbon 13, just one of them. Or you could have like um, over here, maybe a hydrogen off of here is an H2, a deuterium. So if one of the molecules is an ice is one of the rarer isotopes, but it's present, then that molecule would be 87, a little bit heavier. And there it is right there, the little isotope peak. Pretty amazing. It's very accurate, huh? That it can tell the isotopes in it. Also, it makes sense that the car it's smaller than the molecular ion because there's only a 1%, about a 1% chance of having a carbon 13 and even less of a deuterium. It's like 0 0.001 something percent. So what do you think will happen more often? Do you think you'll more often, the isotope peak will be caused by a deuterium or a carbon 13? Yeah, the deuterium. Not, not the deuterium. <laughs> no, it's less likely that the deuterium is causing it. Sorry. There's, it's more often you'll have a carbon 13. <laughs> Okay, so now what about these other ones, these fragments? So the fragments can come about from a no number of mechanisms. I like these mechanisms, fragmentation mechanisms. There's a, there's a bunch of them. I'm just going to have you learn two of them. I'll have you learn them and I'll test you for them. So there's the alpha cleavage and the McClafferty rearrangement. They're both pretty good. And you'll be able to find a lot of like strong signals with these. So we're gonna do, we're gonna learn both of those and we're gonna, I'm gonna see if, if our molecular ion fragments into some of these signals we're seeing over here. Uh, one other thing too, this tallest signal, it's called the base peak. Um, it's the, uh, the most common ion. In, its, in this molecule when it breaks up. So the remember, this is a radical and a carbocation, not a carbocation, it's an oxygen, oxy cation, but it's radical and cation. So it's very high in energy. And as it's traveling towards the detector to get it bent in the magnetic field, it usually breaks apart. And it most often breaks apart into this, but it also breaks apart into all these other things because it's just such a high energy species. Okay, so let's start with the, um, we'll do the alpha cleavage first, and we'll see if it shows up on here. So, slides. Okay, here we go. Okay. So here we go. I have my molecular ion here. Okay. 
this carbon at the bottom is the carbonyl, not the bottom, right here with the oxygen noble bond. This is the carbonyl carbon, right? Right next door to the carbonyl carbon, that's an alpha carbon, alpha to the carbonyl. And then over here, we have another alpha carbon, and the methyl on that side. So the alpha cleavage is referring to cleaving these alpha carbons. So let's try the, the left side first. So I'll go, I'll draw the radical on this side. It'll be a little easier to see. And I'll write out CH3 so it's more obvious. So here's the alpha cleavage of the methyl. It's a radical mechanism. You can draw a fish hook arrow like that. And there's two electrons in this bond between the carbonyl carbon and the alpha methyl. One of them is going to go meet me halfway. And the other one is going to go to the methyl. And this will give us the following. It's easy to miss number these or to miscount the carbon. So I'm going to number them. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, I didn't lose any carbons. Now, uh, and I've got this alpha cleavage. I cleaved off the alpha methyl on the side here. That alpha carbon's cleaved. Um, this one right here has no charge. The methyl, do you think it'll be detected? So its path is not bent by the magnetic field because it doesn't have charge, not bent much. I'd say not bent by a magnetic field. Detected. So that one won't be detected as is unless it somehow gets a charge before it gets to the detector. But this other one, this one has charge, will be detected. This will be detected. So the charged ones is what we need, right? And let me uh, back it up really quick. Remember, when we come into the mass spectrometer, we get ionized by an electron beam. And then because there's a charge to this molecular ion, its path is bent towards the detector. If it fragments before it gets into the magnetic field, its path will be bent as well to the detector. So let's see what we got here. What's the formula for this charged particle here? How many carbons does it have? C, C4, yep, only four carbons. Now it lost one. H what? Two, four, five, six, seven. H seven and an oxygen. Yep, there we go. So what is this way? The carbons, we've got four of them times 12. That's 44, 48. The hydrogens, we have, this is, remember, it's carbon-12, most abundant isotope, H1, not 10. Uh, we got seven hydrogens times one, that's seven. And then the oxygen, 16, it's going to be uh, one of them times 16. 16, so if I add all this up, I get, <clears throat> what's that, 15 and 6, 21, 71. Mass to charge ratio, is that right? 15 and 21, yep, six, seven. Yep. Okay, so we got 21. I double checked my math there in my head. I went back over it. Let's see if we can find that on the, on the mass spectrum. Do we see something to 71? There it is. Isn't that cool? So this fragment, One, two, three, four, that's it, right? That's right here, 71.
there's something intellectually pleasing about finding, you know, the, the, the signals on the mass spec to me. So that's this one's the uh, 71 mass to charge. There we go, we got it. Okay, now let's look at the other one. Um, we looked at the alpha cleavage on the left. Let's look at the alpha cleavage on the right. Let's see, that's one of the peaks in the, in the spectrum. So I'll go other alpha cleavage. Okay, here we go. Can you meet me halfway? Two electrons here, one's going there, one's going there. I'm gonna number these again to make sure I'm not losing anything, losing or gaining carbon atoms. So I've got carbon one, two, three, four, five. And notice I've been drawing this cation um, linear because the carbon with the triple bond to the oxygen only has an oxygen and a methyl, so it should be linear. Okay, so will the um, primary ra radical here, will this be detected? as is, it just remains like that. No, no charge. But the other particle will, the cation will. And what do we have here? We have for this one, for the carbons, we have two carbons, right? Times 12, the most abundant isotope, that's 24. And then hydrogens, I have three times one, three. And the oxygen, I have one of them times 16, which is 16. I add all this up, I get 13 and 43. Yep. Let me double check on that. 12 times two is 24, three, 16. I got nine and four is 13 two, three, four. Yep. Looks correct. All right. Let's see if we can find something at 43 in our mass spectrum. Oh yeah. That's the base peak. That's happening the most. Cool. Not only did we find a couple, well, we've already been able to identify one, the isotope peak, the molecular ion two, three, this alpha cleavage product, and then four, that alpha cleavage product. And that's the thing that happens the most often. So most often this molecular ion breaks apart into that fragment. It also breaks into this one, but it most often breaks into that one. Does anybody have a guess at why you get this fragmentation happening more than the other one? I think this is gonna be an endothermic step. I think it's gonna be an endothermic step. This mechanism is gonna be endothermic because you're breaking bonds. Endothermic, so the transition state is gonna look like the products. And the products are going to be, in this case, this cation and a primary radical. In this one, a methyl radical. Hmm. What's more stable, a methyl radical or a primary radical? Let's 
So the radicals are short electrons. They're like, oh, I only have seven electrons. I don't have an octet. I wish I had some help. The primary radical has one sp3 carbon that can help donate. I'll help out. The methyl radical just got these three hydrogens that just don't care. They're not helping at all. So which one's more stable? The primary is more stable. So if it's more stable, lower in energy, that means the transition state that it came from that looks like it is lower in energy. No, that, that, that seems like a good reason to explain why we get more of it. It's a, it's, it's a faster formed radical and it doesn't reverse back. It's similar to grumpy cations, but cations are, now we're focused on the carbon part. Because these both these cations are similar, they're both oxygen pluses. All right, so we got two of them. Uh, let's actually pause here. Let's take our break a little bit. Is this earlier than normal? Yeah, I think it's a little earlier. I think that's a good time though. And then when we come back, we'll do the McLafferty rearrangement. Okay, <clears throat> so let's summarize and then do our last cleavage or uh, Call a rearrangement, kind of the same thing though. So we started off with the ketone here. Two pentanone, carbon one, two. And when it gets injected into the mass spectrometer, an electron beam hits an electron off of it. So it loses one electron. Doesn't really change its mass at all. Electrons are so light. The mass of this molecule is primarily from its neutrons and protons. But because we gave it a charge, its path can be bent towards the detector. And uh, it's bent, it'll be bent towards the detector by a magnetic field. And it's bend, the bend in the path is due to uh, the charge and the mass of the molecule. But our mass spectrometer, we calibrate it, so it just gives a plus one charge. So it's really just the mass. So it shows up at like 86 mass to charge units as the molecular ion. Um, and then um, it can fragment though. It can do an alpha cleavage or it can cleave off this methyl or the propyl on the other side. When it cleaves the methyl, it results in a methyl with no charge, not detected. But then it will also result in this right here, which has a mass charge of 71. And when we look, there it is, 71. Then uh, cleaving on the other side, taking off the propyl, gives you this charged species that has a mass charge ratio of 43, the base peak, the tallest peak. So the molecule fragments to this most often, more than anything else. There is another one of rearrangement or fragmentation that we want to learn as well. It is called the McLafferty rearrangement. So the McLafferty, it sounds to me like a, like maybe the, a cop who like, McLafferty's this cop who, who's really a, who's abrupt. Nobody wants to be a partner with him. But when you need the case to be solved, you call in McLafferty. He'll, I heard one time he killed himself and he went to hell to get the perp and brought him back to life to put him in behind bars. So McLafferty's coming through. So for the McLafferty, it's going to be, the key thing to look for is a six atom ring. We, we're going to see a six atom ring transition state and it will be a six atom ring transition state, I think, because six atom rings are stable, like we've talked about um, cyclohexane chairs and things like that. And the atoms, the way you want to count it is you want to start with an oxygen. So in our case, it's going to be the oxygen of the ketone to a carbon, a second atom, then another carbon, then another carbon. Let me count these as I go. It's going to be six atoms. One, two, three, four. 
five. And then off of the fifth carbon, you need a hydrogen. That's our six atom. So this isn't all carbon atoms. It's an oxygen to start and a hydrogen to end, but carbon's in between. Okay, I'll show you what I mean. So when I look at this molecular ion, if I start counting from the oxygen to the left, one, two, three, I can throw a hydrogen on here, but that would be four. It's too short. No McClafferty to this side. McClafferty. If I count the other way, though, one, two, three, four, five. Oh, yeah, I could do it. It's going to be just long enough. Six. I can McClafford either that sign. Good. So I'll show you how I do that. I take what I've drawn so far. I shrink it down a little bit, give myself some room. <laughs> and then I, I draw the molecule again. I'm going to draw it in a way that it will react or the way I believe it reacts in a six member drink. One, two, three, four, five, six. There it is. Got a little wonky there. Let's fix that up. So I just twisted around the bonds to make this hydro this hydrogen up here six. I'll, I'll number it for you too, so you can see it. So I've got the oxygens one, carbon two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, that's the same molecule, right? And when it can bend itself around into the six-membered ring, it can react the following way. So imagine this oxygen is like a hinge for this pi bond to swing up and deprotonate that hydrogen. And then we have, uh, you know, actually I'm gonna use different colors than I did. Let's make the oxygen a yellow hinge here. This oxygen is a hinge. So this pi bond is gonna swing up like that. And then we'll have another hinge on carbon five and the CH bond is gonna break and swing down to make a pi bond of four. And a third hinge on carbon three as this swings. Like so. A lot going on in this McClafferty, huh? McClafferty. I'll number it to keep track of what's going on. One, two, three, four, five. There we go. Yeah, that looks like everything. So when the McClafferty rearrangement occurs with its crazy three hinges and all this pi bond breaking and forming, when this occurs, um, which particle will be detected? The alkene or this other thing that's called an enol? Is this alkene detected? No charge for that one, right? But the other one will be detected because it has a charge. What's its molecular formula? C, what? How many carbons does this have? C3, H, how many hydrogens? H6, it's got two here, one there, three, and three more, six, yep. And an oxygen. So what does it weigh? Three times 12 equals 33, 36. Hydrogen, it's six times one and that is going to be six and then the oxygen one times 16 16 add this all up i get 18 here 58 mass to charge let me double check so 
33, 36, yeah. Six, 16, so 12 and 6, 18, 58, yeah. Okay, so let's see, is that gonna be on our mass spectrum? Is it on there, do you see it? Do we have a 58? We do, there it is. Nice. Something went weird on my iPad. Okay, I don't know why that got erased, but here it is again. There it is. The McClafferty. Nice. So we were able to identify from this spectrum the isotope peak, one thing, the molecular ion, an alpha cleavage, a McClafferty, and another alpha cleavage. Five different signals. Pretty good, huh? So well, I'm not going to teach you how to like determine all of these, but uh, I think I've taught you more than pretty much every other first-year chemist learns about this stuff because I just like it. I like these mechanisms. Um, yeah, the alpha cleavage. And I have a lot more practice of this for you. It's in the, <clears throat> mass spectroscopy material to memorize GSA. So I've got this Google slide animation that'll step you through these. And um, it'll also have a link to the quiz that you're gonna take this week. So let me just show you a little bit of this. I'm gonna have you do it most all of this on your own. Um, but here's this slide that, you know, the basic concepts you need to know, you know how the basic mass spectrometer works. Your molecule enters, gets ionized, the magnetic field bends it to the detector. And know these most abundant isotopes. I'll mention the bromine shortly. Isotope peak, alpha cleavages, McClafferty's, the odd, we'll get to the odd stuff shortly and the other stuff shortly. But let me show you a nice one here. The mass three. Yeah, I'll do this one real quick. Yeah, let's do one. So here's one where uh, go back a little bit. So I've got a molecule. This is an alpha cleavage that's different than the one we just saw because it doesn't have a carbonyl. But hopefully, you'll when you see it, you'll think you'll notice. Oh yeah, the same thing. So the molecule enters the mass spectrometer and gets ionized by an electron beam. There's actually other ways to ionize molecules. You can do it just like by protonating it, like an acid, a chemical ionization, but this one's the most common. So you get an ion. This molecular ion can have its path bent to the detector, but on the way to the detector, it's most often gonna break apart because it's such a heavy, I mean, it's such a high energy uh, radical cation. And the formula for it though is three, four, five, H12. Oh yeah, zero degrees on saturation. It's gonna weigh 88 mass to charge. Okay, so here I'm gonna do my alpha cleavage. So this is how it works for this one. So I have my carbon that has the alcohol oxygen. This carbon one away is alpha to that al alcohol carbon. Uh, and I know this is slightly different terminology of alpha, like we saw um, in mass spectra and, and NMR and stuff. We say this this carbon's alpha to oxygen is attached, but here it's yeah it's one away. But hopefully that you don't even this. I guess this isn't. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, you if you if you're comfortable with the curved arrows, that's the key. All right, so here we go. We got those two particles, and uh, if I number them, I'm less likely to make a mistake. So carbon three is alpha to carbon with the alcohol. Got my numbers on here. So I lost those two carbons. The, the, the charged fragment is a C3H7, 59. All right, now we're gonna do another one another cleavage. I'm going to cleave off a methyl, not the ethyl. There it is. And that one weighs 73. 
mass to charge ratio. So these fragments in the molecular ion can enter into the magnetic field and have their path bent by the detector. But this one, its path is not bent because of why. Why isn't that carbon three and four with the radical? Why isn't that one's path bent? No charge, yep. But the 59 will get its path bent. And its bend of its path is dependent on its mass and its charge. It's got a plus one charge, so it's really just mass. Then uh, it hits the detector. The detector it hits it like 59. Then the molecular ion, the, if, it, if it doesn't um, fragment, when it doesn't fragment, its path is bent. But is it bent the same or less does, than the first one? It's bent less, huh? So why is it its path bent less? It's got a charge. So its path is bent less because it's heavier. The heavier the particle, the less the magnetic field can change its path. Its momentum is not, its momentum is too strong. It won't get bent as much. So this is how you can determine like, oh, 88 hits over here, 59 hits here because the heavier doesn't bend as much. And then this one, 73, is going to hit right in the middle because it's, you know, their path's bent according to the mass. The lighter they are, the more they bend, the heavier, the less. And then this methyl radical, no charge, passes right by. And so here's the actual mass spectrum for the molecule uh, from SDDS. So here, the molecular ion is right here. Oh, it was actually cut off on this one. Yeah, they didn't have it online, but it would be over here, the 88. This fragment, 59 right there that's the base peak the tallest one huh so that happens most often that fragmentation then the other alpha cleavage leads to that one at um, 673 just as we predicted uh, and then sent to somebody to, oh well now actually it's not on that one never mind all right, we already saw that one. Let's do this one really quick. This is a good McClafferty. We saw these alpha cleavages, yeah. And then the McClafferty uses a six-membered ring transition like, like these common sugars, gluco, glucose and uh, sucrose. So for the McClafferty, you count across one to six. And so if I count to the left, it's too short. But if I count to the right, I got a hydrogen off of carbon five, I got it. And now what I have to do is I have to take, uh, what? I froze up a minute, sorry. I have to take and rotate around carbons three and four to bring five and six up and then rotate again to bring six over. So now it's in that six membered ring. And then my curved arrows can come in. I'm gonna actually move it over to this position. So I just basically, I'm replacing this with its rotated version. And uh, there we go. We got the McClafferty going on. So the, <clears throat> the lighter 29 mass charge fragments bent the most. The molecular ions bent the least. And this McClafferty ion, well, the alkane's not, is bent in between there. And here we go. Uh, I've got the molecular ion at 72. I've got an isotope peak, which could have a carbon 13 here, or it could be any of the carbons, it could be carbon 13, or it's less likely, but I could have one deuterium and no carbon 13s. Isotope peak. And then this one here is due to the alpha cleavage, 29, and the McClafferty made the base peak this time. Remember the base peak is the tallest peak, it's, it's, it's the ion that is made the most when the Molecu the molecular ion, the molecular ion for this one actually stays together pretty good. This it's the second most abundant, but a little more often it does break apart with Clafferty. Okay. All right, so we're getting the idea of visualizing these. Now we can start looking at molecules mass specs on STBS and we're gonna start to use them too in determining unknown structures. So 
I have to show you how that works. So this is what I'm talking about. If we go to this problem, this was on a final exam last year for 12B, Kim 12B. And this will be a typical type of problem we'll have. You'll see when you look at this, we have a carbon spectrum here. And we have the proton NMR and the IR, and then we have the mass spec. What, what bit of information is this missing that you normally will get, you've gotten so far when we give you, when I give you the multiple spectrum problems, what do I usually give you also besides this? Yeah, I usually give you the molecular formula. So now that we've learned about mass spec, I don't have to give you the molecular formula. And it's nice. Now you're you're fully grown up organic chemist. You don't need to be given like the the crutch of a molecular formula. You're going to be given just data, just from experiments, and you'll be able to determine the structure and everything. So how do we do this? I'll show you. We're going to use this thing called the rule of thirteen. generate molecular formulas. And the mass spec. So this mass spectrum, we're going to use it to get formulas that we weren't given. So I'll do that on the next slide. I'll show you. So what's the molecular ion for this? 86. So this is how it works. So the 13 comes from the most abundant isotopes of carbon and hydrogen. So what they're referring to is when you have one carbon 12 and one H1, that equals 13 mass to charge. So this is what we do. We take our molecular ion for the example we're looking at, it's 86 mass to charge units. And We have to divide this by 13 old school with remainders and stuff. So let's see, what is 13 times? I'm going to try some out. Six, 18, that'd be seven, eight, 88. That's too much, huh? It's going to have to be five. So 13 times five, one, five, five, 65. I subtract, oh, wait, I'm going to get too much. So is it? Did I do that 13 times six, right? No, it's seven, 78 plus 13. Yeah, no, it's going to be six, sorry. <laughs> okay, here we go. Dusting off the fourth grade math skills. So six times 13, that's going to be 118, right? 78. So I'll make this eight. It'll be remainder of eight. Remember remainders back in the day? You can do this on your calculator too. Um, if you, I could show you how if you want, but I'm just going to show you the old school first. So um, let me double check this. You have to double check everything on this. If you don't double check on this, you're bound to make a mistake that's going to hurt you bad. Don't do it. So here's my double check. I'm going to go 13 times 6, 1, 8, 6, 78, plus 8, 1, 6, 86. Yep, it double checks. We're good. And now what does this mean? This means I have six, I could have six CHs, six times CH, because remember they weigh 12 and one, that's the 13, plus eight more, I'm gonna just call them hydrogens, because each hydrogen weighs one for the remainder. So a potential formula for this, is C6H6 plus another H8 
eight, which is uh, equal to C6H14, huh? Now, I'm gonna double check this again too. What should this weigh? This should weigh 86. So six times 12 for the carbon is 72 plus 14 for the hydrogens. That's 686, yeah, looks good. That's my another, another double check. So this is a potential formula. This might be the formula for our molecule, um, but it might also be ridiculous. It might not make sense. Sometimes you'll get junk formulas out of this rule of 13 that you'll have to adjust to make them reasonable. The way you check to see if this formula is reasonable is you need to, uh, one way to do it is to calculate degrees of unsaturation. So this first unreasonable. Let's check it. Degrees of unsaturation formula. This is what I do. I do my formula degrees of unsaturation carbon plus one minus hydrogen plus halogen minus nitrogen all over two. Okay, so I've got six carbons plus one minus six, 14 hydrogens, plus zero halogens, minus zero nitrogens, all over two. And I got seven minus 14 over two. You notice I'm doing this really slow. And zero degrees unsaturation sounds totally reasonable. Definitely could be. Um, the, the unreasonable will be sometimes you'll get like a negative un degrees of unsaturation. So you have like a negative pi bond, that doesn't make any sense. And so if I want, I can start drawing up possible molecules with this formula. So it's just a bunch of things with zero degrees on saturation. It could be N hexane, two, four, six, that's possible. It could be two methyl pentane, three methyl pentane, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yep, could be two, two dimethyl butane, all kinds of things, right? Oh. Could be two, three dimethyl butane. Yep, this is definitely possible. Does this seem to be what our molecule is for this example? So, oh no, we've got a signal around 200 and something about nine and a half. This molecule has got an aldehyde in it. So it's definitely not these ones, these pure alkanes, they wouldn't have those signals. So wait, if we have an aldehyde, it's definitely an aldehyde here, right? Then that means we need an oxygen. We need an oxygen for sure, right? Hmm. So how do we do that? I'll show you. So if you need an oxygen, I'll call this my second formula. We need to know that oxygen 16 is equivalent to a carbon 12 and four hydrogens H1s. They weigh the same, right? carbon 12 plus four more is 16. So then I can use that idea to say, oh, this initial formula, C6H14, if I subtract a CH4 and I add an oxygen 16, it should weigh the same amount. It should still weigh 86 mass to charge ratio. So I get C5H10O. That could be my formula. Um, let me do my double check. Remember, I'm a constant double checker on this stuff. So I've got 12 times 5 for the carbons, which is 60. 
55, 60, plus 10 for the hydrogen, 70 plus 16 for the oxygen, 86. It looks good. And then I also needed to check my reasonableness. Degrees of unsaturation. I got five carbons plus one minus 10 hydrogens minus zero plus zero nitrogens, halogens minus zero nitrogens all over two. I got six minus 10 over two. That's six minus five. I've got one degree of unsaturation. Oh, that looks like it's going to work. I have an aldehyde, right? And it would have one degree of unsaturation. So I'm going to guess my formula is this C5H10O. That's what I got, right? C5H10O? Yeah. I bet that's the formula for this one. Yeah, and it's an aldehyde. So let's draw up an aldehyde, see if any of these make sense. I got an aldehyde here. And five carbons. But four carbon signals. That means there's symmetry in the molecule, huh? So I'm just gonna make a guess at that. I'm gonna say isopropyl, let's go. I got one, two, three, three, one, two, three, four, five. Let's try that. So one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, would that work? That would give me one, two, three, four carbon signals. That looks good. I'd get my aldehyde, carbonyl, sp3 carbon hydrogens under 3000. And then my proton NMR, that's gonna be the key. What sort of coupling should this have? This is a one hydrogen. Hmm, what kind of coupling should that have? Aldehydes can be tricky. They sort of feel like they don't couple as like they should to you. So let me count bonds. I have two hydrogens here. They're one, two, three bonds away. Oh yeah, it's definitely coupling to those. One, two, three. So it's got two neighbors there. So it's a one hydrogen triplet. The two neighbors are equivalent. And it's an aldehyde, so it should show up about 9.5 parts per million. Am I seeing that on my screen? On my chromatograph, I am. I told you it's a triplet too, huh? Yeah, that's signal A. Looking good. Okay, next up, I've got a two hydrogen signal, alpha to a carbonyl, and how many neighbors does it see? It's got the one aldehyde neighbor, one, and then one here too. It's got another one there. So it's got two neighbors, so it's a triplet, but a triplet. Because it's got two neighbors that are not equivalent. It's got an aldehyde neighbor that's different than this tertiary neighbor here. Okay, alpha to a carbonyl. I'm going to guess around two parts per million. And I'm saying that one is the, I think it's, it's overlapping with C here. I think that's B. Yeah, I think that's signal B right there. Then we've got our one hydrogen, what? How many neighbors does this one have? Two, five, six, seven, eight? Eight, huh? And are those neighbors the same? Nope. That's going to be a one hydrogen no net. about one part per million. So that one, yeah, that's the C, huh? Yeah, it's got a lot of signals there. And I'm gonna do this one in different colors so I can 
differentiate it. That one is a six hydrogen doublet, about one part per million. And it, oh, I did too many P's. Part per million, and it's showing up at as D there, huh? All right, yeah, this is definitely the molecule, huh? And here, I'll just do the rest of the spectra real quick since I can't to really confirm it all. So on the IR, I can uh, label my carbonyl. It's a nice strong carbonyl there. And then my sp3 carbon hydrogens, my alkane carbon hydrogens, they are under 3000. And these two right here, we didn't memorize that, but that's the CH of the aldehyde. Okay, and for carbon NMR, So I'm definitely saying carbonyl carbon is one. And I think, I don't know about this one. I'm going to call this X, that X, and all this X. I'm going to say X is equal to two or three or four. I can look it up on STBS. And so isn't it nice that you can, you know, really make sure you have the right answer if you know how to label your proton, your carbon, and your IR. And now we can do mass spec too. So let's check this out. Let's see if we can find some mass spec signals in here. So if my aldehyde comes into the mass spectrometer, neutral, it can get hit with an electron beam and knock off an electron. And then it has lots of options for it to uh, fragment. This right here is the base of the molecular ion. 86 mass to charge and the isotope peak will be if it you know has a carbon 13 or deuterium um one fragmentation is uh, to alpha cleavage to the right here so there's two electrons here this is the alpha carbon one can go to the alpha carbon and one can Meet me halfway to give that and the following. Let me number these to make sure I didn't lose any. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Got it. Only the Charge one will show up, which has the formula CHO. That's it, huh? So what is that way? It weighs 12 plus 1 plus 16, 29. Do we see that? Oh, we do. Nice. It's right there, huh? Got it. Uh, let's look at, can we do a McClafferty with this one? 
let's see if I go one, two, three, four, five. Oh yeah, we can do McLafferty. We got McLafferty coming. Uh, number these differently. So let's go one, two, three, four, five. Yep, we're there. We got a six member ring. If I count around one, two, three, four, five, six. Yep. So I can add some hinges, say this oxygen's hinged here. And then this will be a hinge right here. And that'll be a hinge right there. Let's draw it. Swing up, deprotonate, swing down to make a pi bond, swing down to make a pi bond. There we go. Number it, make sure I didn't miscount. Got it. Um, and this right here weighs C two H four O. So that's twenty four plus four. I'm getting sloppy here. 24 plus 4 plus 16, 1, 4. Is that 44? It is 44. And look at that. It's up on our, it's our base peak. The McLafferty.